Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Gabriel Sanders, public programs producer at the museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our final keynote event of today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. This keynote is on Kosher Soul, the faith and food journey of an African-American Jew with Michael W. Twitty and Jane Ziegelman. Today, we hosted 32 events throughout the museum with 85 speakers and 72 author signings. For those joining us via live stream, you can purchase the books from today's events at mjhnyc.org shop. On your next visit to the museum, we encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do on the main level, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholler on the third floor. Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones is also worth a visit just outside our wonderful Cafe Locks. Um, our shop is still open, and you can pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Museum shop. We are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you will share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made, is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority. Your donations also help us present these programs. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Michael W. Twitty is a noted culinary and cultural historian and the creator of Afro Culinaria, the first blog devoted to African American historic foodways and their legacies. He has been honored by FirstWeFeast.com as one of the 20 greatest food bloggers of all time, named one of the 50 people who are changing the South by Southern Living, and one of the five chefivists to watch by TakePart.com. Twitty has appeared in numerous media and has given more than 250 talks in the United States and abroad. His work has appeared in Ebony, The Guardian, and on NPR.org. He is also a Smith Fellow with the Southern Foodways Alliance, a TED Fellow and speaker, and the first revolutionary in residence at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Jane Ziegelman, a James Beard award-winning food historian, is the author of 97 Orchard, an edible history of five immigrant families in one New York tenement, and A Square Meal, a culinary history of the Great Depression, which she wrote together with her husband, Andrew Coe. Kosher Soul and 97 Orchard are available for purchase in our lobby, and Michael and Jane will sign copies after the event. Just wanted to mention that um, as we began planning this New York Jewish Book Festival, um, I reached out to Michael Twitty and his acceptance of our invitation to join us at this event really kickstarted our planning. Um, and it's such a great honor and privilege to have him here with us. Um, please join me in welcoming Michael W. Twitty and Jane Ziegelman. Do we? Probably do. Yeah, okay. We love this because I must tell you, I'm gonna preempt what Jane has to say, but um, I've been able to explore Kosher Soul with um, my good friend Tony Westbrook, who's a fellow African American Jew and educator and activist in St. Louis, with um, Marcy Cohen Ferris, um, with Joe Nathan. Um, with many others, and it's an honor to have this conversation with you. Uh, Jane's book, I always get the number wrong. Is it 97 or 98? It's 97. Thank you, 97. I'm, I'm numerically dyslexic, and I really, I really am. That's not a joke. Um, 97 Orchard was such a revelation to me because it's one thing to write a book about food and recipes, it'd be very practical of a, of a guidebook, right? But then this person who hap we, happen to share, we happen to eventually share an agent writes this book about these families and tells the story of immigration 
and the New York cultural experience and how America became, you know, known for these different cuisines, how they integrated themselves into the whole process of an American palate and traces it through the families. And I said, I've got to do this for black folks. What black folks? The ones I come from. So I told Jane back that I said, I couldn't go to, I wasn't gonna go to Monticello and tell their story. I'm not from Monticello. I'm from the different, I'm from Virginia plantations that were not in Charlottesville. I'm not from Boone Hall in South Carolina, from other places in South Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to tell the story of all of those big communities that bled into. So I cannot thank you enough. I can't be grateful enough to have this conversation with you tonight, but also just acknowledge you as someone who has completely changed um, the nature of this literature and the honor that you gave to all of the ancestors at the Tenement Museum in that community, but also millions upon millions of people whose stories would not have otherwise been told. Um, I, what, what, how does one respond? Michael, thank you. Um, we, um, I think we've admired each other from afar for a while now. So it's wonderful to admire you close up, and um, I'm, you know, I'm indebted to you too. So it's uh, no, strictly mine. mutual. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go. <laughs> um, what I would like to do, Michael, sure. is to start off with some vocabulary questions. Uh, for those of you who have not yet read Kosher Soul, you'll see that in order to tell his story, Michael uses quite a number of both Yiddish and Hebrew words and phrases. And these are the words that I'm interested in. Starting with mishpocha. Mm -hmm. Mishpocha is the Yiddish word for family. Mishpacha, the Hebrew, Michael gives us both. And Michael, you call family the most imperative of Jewish words. What do you mean? So in our current um, angst over anti-Semitism, anti-Jewishness, people are, the muddling of terms is, is, is coming on fast, right? So people are looking at this as a faith issue, religion. I had to use the term faith in my title because they're the people who won't compute the word peoplehood. Mm -hmm. Why are you my Lundsman? Why are you my Mishpocha? Because we come from the same places, right? Not just physical place, spiritual place, intellectual place, place in the Kishkas, all of that. When you are gay, the, the, old, the old term was our oh, so-and-so family. Mm -hmm. Very polite way of saying, If you black, you you can folk where you can folk at, especially if you're going down south. What do you feel that mishpocha and kin folk carry the same? Yes. Force. Kin folk is a very strong term, and I guess what I'm what I'm really getting at is that Jewishness is about peoplehood. Jewishness is about familyhood. The our, Judaism is the religious civilization of the Jewish people, not the other way around. What's more important? What's, what's, what's really the heart of the conversation about being a Jew? Why, you know, why are there certain things that some Jews will do regardless of their religious belief or engagement, and others will not, but, uh, but things we'll all do? Why? Because it's about being mishpacha to each other, about being family to each other. And I think that family is the most important word across all of these things. You know, I've, I've often told people, I said, when you're a Muslim, you're part of an ummah. That means you're part of a sisterhood, a brotherhood in Islam. When you're Christian, you're part of an ecclesia, a church, okay? When you're Jewish, you're part, you are bin bat. That's your relationship to the actual, to actual people and to the people of our sacred myth. You know, you're always son of, daughter of, part of. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I use that word. You 
You use it where other people use community. Because mm -hmm. I think community is a stupid word. How would you Every time I hear the word, the LGBT community, I'm like, what, what's that? Mm -hmm. Being part of it. Every time I hear the word Jewish community, I'm like, okay. So, it, so, the, so you mean if I take somebody from Satmar and Lubavitch and somebody from Bells and somebody from the Reconstructionist Temple mm -hmm. and someone from the Reform Shul and someone who is a secular Yiddishist and put them in the same room, they're going to have a conversation that's going to make sense. It's not a community, but they are mishpacha. At the end of the day, they are, they are family. Community, I don't know. Community gets overused because yeah. it assumes, it's, when you think of community, the first word, the first thing that pops in your head is like that third grade social studies vision. Little houses, little trees, happy people, dogs, cats, maybe a goldfish, carp in a bathtub, something. <laughs> uh -huh. But it's not, it's not the same thing as what it really means to have bonds. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes you don't even know you have a bond until you have that moment of experience. Well, I think the key word for me in what you just said is kishka. It's down here. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel community gets at that place right. in the way that family does. Because this is the other part of your intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not just here. It's the other. This is why people have the saying, I felt it in my gut. You know, when you look at, I'll, I'll, I'll even make this analogy across the board. You know, on the cooking gene, I talked about this. When you look at certain sculptures from West Central Africa, particularly Central Africa, you know, uh, art historians, the anthropologists call them fetish figures. I hate that. They're power objects. They're the ancestors. And in the middle is the mirror, the glass, the quartz. Well, that's where the guts are. It's where you see, your, you see yourself reflected as a descendant. So when we say, I feel it in my kishkas, we look at that, that statuary, when we refer to that other intelligences in our guts, it means that when we eat, we're eating here, 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 here. And that's also part of the way we construct cuisine. Next word, maise. Mm. Maise is the Yiddish word for <laughs> story, anecdote, and kosher soul is filled with maise. But it's also about maise and about storytelling. I'd like to hear from you, Michael, why you feel storytelling is so urgent and particularly for marginalized people. So I got, I pissed some people off royally when they started to harbor content to market this to like people for Google Reads. Oh, never mind. <laughs> and this one person went off about the whole mice thing. She's, first of all, she said I spelled it wrong, uh -huh. which is, everybody should think this, my macro aggression. <laughs> Who does this black guy think he is spelling our words? And if you're gonna be black and Jewish, Show me something I've never seen before. Don't show me more Yiddish, because that's just boring. I'm not here to entertain your ass. I'm not here to, I'm not here to, 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 no, that's not what it's about. I'm doing what I know from a blend of esoteric elements and mainstream American Jewish culture. Mice is a story. I, you, so certain things I can't talk about my own experience or the experience of others that have any sort of relationship to the rest of the constellation of narratives other than me basically saying, in this moment, in this time, this is the story. Our, the Hazal, our rabbinic oral tradition is made up of, of stories that are loosely sewn together. But as a whole, when you look up above them, kind of makes sense where they're going and why they're there. You quote that it's a rabbinic saying, I hope I get this right, to lose a story is to lose an entire world, or is it to save a story? The original is to save a human life, save the entire world. So I say to save a story is to save the entire world. I paraphrase them. Because 
It's true. I mean, we're talking about things you're working on, I'm working on where we find these, these resources, these records that people created so that there would be a blueprint. There would be the breadcrumbs leading back to those spaces. So for me, my say in this book is important because, okay, it's like write a book about food, right? There's a really beautiful book, what's that book? Why Italians eat the way they do and why they're so passionate about food, but you know, mm -hmm. Russian author who lives, who lived in Italy most of, her, most of her career life. Beautiful book, thick book. It's very encyclopedic and anthropological and poetic. poetic. That's not what I wanted to do. These are real people. These are marginalized people. People who are very, very, these, <laughs> you know, people of African descent, Jews, in America, who come from African, African American, Caribbean, Afro Latin, Afro Brazilian backgrounds, who have Cape Verdean backgrounds, who have very sort of tenuous connections to the wider whole, but they're, but they're part of these big areas of American, by American I mean global American history, right? The transatlantic slave trade happens at the same time as the expulsion the Inquisition, Jews from Spain, the ongoing persecution after the expulsion. Which brings in this diaspora, the idea right. of diaspora. And these two, these two groups of people are now like at a moment in global history where as far as the West is concerned, apart from of course the sins of misogyny, um, the oppression of sexual minorities, the disabled, and classism are the two original sins of the West. Anti-Semitism, anti-blackness one being a little bit older than the other, but they're also used to ferment and foment each other constantly. So what was used against Jews 2,000 years ago is used against Africans increasingly as they move from being these exotic, interesting foreigners to being an enslaved class of people. And then what is used against the Africans is then projected against global Jewry. Not to mention what happens to indigenous people in the Americas. Not to mention what happens to India. It's, it, we are, we, it's an infection that, that, much like COVID, <laughs> goes back and forth to all its infectees. Returning to the, to the Misa part of the story, do you see I guess, could you speak a little more specifically about s the meaning or the importance of story in diasporic communities? Because it's about evidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, there are some of those um, um, mices that are in the book that are, that are they're about food, but they're also used as a lens to talk about what does prejudice against somebody like me actually look like? Mm -hmm. What does that feel like? What does it feel like to have a mishpaka moment with a stranger? What does it feel like to, for example, one of my students, former students, it's funny because they're, like, they're all like 30 now, 25, 30 years old now. Katie, Japanese American, Japanese American mom, Ashkenazi dad, affected the look, had the, the phenotype of an Asian American. So for her, goes, goes to a big shul and went to a big shul in Potomac, Maryland, very wealthy area. I don't, not much prejudice in that regard, although I did see other students receive it at other synagogues about being Asian. But of course for her, like her mom, her grandparents had been in Manzanar. Her father's grandparents at least one of them had been in Auschwitz-Birkenau. <laughs> so on both sides of her family, she carried this trauma, right? And it was deep. And so when we did the Silk Road project, which I innovated and brought to Har Shalom, she kind of would roll her eyes like, oh my God, another project. But then I was like, this is an opportunity for you. Because we're talking about all these different Jewish communities in Africa and Asia, the Middle East, et cetera. And one of them was Japan. She said, well, I'll, do, just do, I'll just do Japan. Well, she hemmed and hawed and you know how 12 teenagers do. 
But the day of the actual project, when the social hall is now an air science museum, she got the most beautiful kimono on. And she made kosher sushi, which isn't that hard, y'all, because every, if you know kosher restaurants, every kosher restaurant has to have sushi no matter what, just in case the Mashiach comes. <laughs> and she, at the end of the day, like, I'm, I'm really proud of her. I'm really proud of the rest of my kids. They did a great job. The parents are really happy about it. It was an opportunity for them to learn about multicultural Jewish communities. Great. And I'm up in the room, and Katie's like, gives me this big hug. I'm like, what, what was that for? And the only thing she said to me, the only thing she said to me was, I finally feel like myself. Well, that got to me. And so, I had, so that's, there's no, that's not a 50-page that's chapter. That's just five pages that talk about a moment in my life where food, being a Jew of color, working with a, a child who's a Jew of color, all was beshert. Can, can you talk about a comparable moment from your own life? Hmm, well that was my own life. But I mean, you know. When you felt, I, I'm, I am myself, here I am. Well, I mean, there's a, a billion of them. I mean, uh, look, look at it like this. After the cooking gene was done, I had the opportunity to finally go to Africa. I had the opportunity to finally go to Africa. And so I had all these different moments where I felt this connection and truth and just reality, just things. I, I would often tell people, you know, for, for those of us who are born over here, we don't know how real and natural and important our background is until we go to a place where it's not considered odd exotic, deviant, backwards. I guess in the book, in Kosher Soul, the moment that really communicated that was even before I got to go to the continent. I was in Yerushalayim, Al-Quds, um, and I went to the, the Western Wall. I went to the Kotel. It was my first time going to the Kotel. And it was, it was something. I mean, I understand why people get Jerusalem syndrome. They like lose their mind and they, you know, oh, everything's holy and I get that. And, and you go to this wall and it's just, you cannot believe how many like little pieces of paper. And in fact, this tradition has actually transferred over into Christian and Islamic communities. Do people know about what, what Michael's referring to when he says the little pieces little of paper? Little prayers that you put into the wall. If you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and go to the, the mosques in Jerusalem, you see the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it kind of started with us. And so I'm walking back from the, the, the wall and I'm really, really like, what just happened to me? And I mean, I had all these prayers with me from my students and for me, for my mom, my, my blessed memory and all this stuff. And these, they're like five or six Ethiopian Jewish kids just hanging out. Just hanging out. Like, it's like a weird place to just hang out. And they have one, like, Walkman between them. And I was like, hey, what's up? And they're like, achi, achi, brother, brother, brother. And I said, what you listen? At that time, it was like way early 2000s. I was like, B2K. I'm like, what? Okay, cool. And so one of them had a shirt on, and the shirt had on Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, one of the King Mandela. And I don't, I don't, to this day, I'm not the best he Hebrew speaker, but I knew a little bit. And one of my fellow people on my birthright trip knew a lot more than I did. And they were just like, where are you from? And where are you going? What are you doing here? And I said, I'm from America. And they said, America! And they all, they had to touch me. It's one thing about Ethiopian Jews in Israel, every time I've been to Israel, they have to touch me, my real. And they all like gave me the hug and pat in the back. And when they said, when I had to go, so I said, oh, I'm sorry, my brothers, I have to go. So they all went, shalom, Ahi. 
that was my moment that she had. It really was. You know, the, the, next word the next word I wanted to ask you about, I think bears some relation to the story you just told. And the word is hineni. Mm -hmm. Presentness. I am here. Right. First, if you could tell us a little bit about hineni in scripture and why you have adopted it as a kind of anthem. Because it's the moment um, Avraham and others, when they hear, hear God's voice, <laughs> I'm here, I'm present, what's next? I'm in, I'm in this moment, um, I really am hearing you, I acknowledge your presence. You know, that's, that's a deep thing. Um, you know, those, of, those, of, those who can remember cable access was also Esther Young Grice's like program, he named me, right? Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a modus operandi for saying that whatever I'm doing, I'm here, I hope that the divine presence is with me, I hope the ancestors are with me, I hope that those who are to come are with me. I was wondering, because you also talk about invisibility, in the book. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if Hineni was in some way a way, is, was a way to push back yes. against in what you call invisibility. Absolutely, because if I'm present and I'm here, and you can't forget that I'm here. Deal with me, I'm here. Deal with me, I'm here. You know, a couple years ago I was at the Southern Food Ways Alliance, and they have all, you know, different groups of fellows they were acknowledging, and I remember I was one of the only, me and myself, another person, one of the only two that came from the original group to the full three years, and the person who was on stage did not acknowledge us. Hmm. And I'm like in a space where you only have 10 black men out of 600 people. And out of 600 people, another 15 other African Americans. Like, hell, hell you will sit up there and not acknowledge my presence after all I've worked and done to get here. He mm -hmm. And I literally stood up in that such a crowd of people and said, um, and Michael Twitty and so-and-so. <laughs> he, well, he, he goes, okay, well, anyways. He, he had one second to get off that stage, by the way. But that anyways. Because I was just like, you know what? But John T. Edge saved him. But I was like, mm-mm. I get that so often. Not you. Not this form that you've taken to tell these stories, to teach these lessons. Maybe somebody else. That's so insulting. With one life to live, that's so, in, in this incarnation, that is so insulting. And I think that, you know, being standing and being counted right now, if I may so so without too much of a tangent, is really important. I'm not, you know, in, uh, you know, we're here to talk about the book and the food and everything else, but to be honest with you, I'm so frustrated right now, Jane, because in this entire month-long spate of arguments and conversations, how many voices of Jews of color have you seen in the media represented to talk about these things? Not that many. People have not really outreached to, I don't care if they reach out to me, but they reach out to all these other voices that I have in the book and beyond doing fabulous work. And I don't see that. I'm just like, this is why the problems will continue because we lack nuance, we lack complexity, and we don't, so maybe somebody doesn't want those, that cantankerousness to end. I do, I don't have time for it. I call it the hamster wheel. Uh, what do we call ourselves? What should people call us? Um, uh, I'm, I'm no slavery, no, being an African king and queen, da -da 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 -da. hamster wheel nonsense. If you, if, you, you also, if you were also a fellow black person, and you said, I'm black, I'm African-American, I say, I'm African-American, it doesn't matter to me. We both have the right to, and to center ourselves the identity which we feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's not the most important thing. Why are our children still drinking lead water? Are we safe when we go into spaces being with our black bodies? So that's more important to me. You get what I'm saying? I do. In the same way that's like, is it more important to this person's opinions or more important that people are standing above a freeway 
saying we don't like you, mm -hmm. that shuls are being, the people's mezuzahs are being taken off the wall, off the door, that people's children are being threatened. What's more important here? And so I don't like it when we, 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 we have an addiction to this like, cycle. This is why I use food to shut it up. You, take, you make the food good, right? You sit down with the person who you may have some enmity with or some conflict with. You shove the food in their mouth. <laughs> they start uh -huh. chewing and they can't talk nonsense at you. That's how it works. I've watched my, my, my parents and grandparents do this. It's a coping mechanism, but it's also a way to tell people we, we can be cool with each other to a certain point. I will not concede my humanity. I will not concede my dignity. But I do want you to understand I am present. I am present through my voice, through my eyes, through the food that you're eating, the contributions that I've made to this culture. And that goes for Jewish culture as well. I mean, here we are, many of us, Jews of color, Jews of African descent, black Jews, making significant contributions to Jewish culture in America and have been doing so for quite some time. And I, I, I don't know, I, should I deliberately say it in the book? I don't know. I, I sort of do and I sort of don't. I, I go at it from both ends. But I want people to understand we're not just outliers. We're part of Jewish civilization, Jewish history, Jewish life in America. That's actually something I wanted to ask you about, Michael. Sure. What I sense as a kind of ambivalence or tension in the book about your insistence on one hand that we are not exotics and we are not outlier, outliers, we are part of this, we are in this story just like you are. That's one side. And the other side is I'm different and I love my differentness. Mm -hmm. Is there a little bit of push-pull? That is Du bois as it gets. That is W.E.B. Du Bois. That is the double consciousness that's inherent in us. It's also queerness. In the book, I also talk about queerness, and people say, well, queerness. What? So they always go to sexuality. Mm -mm. Queerness is also about othering. The perception of being odd. There's a, there's a little funny BuzzFeed video, something like that, about things only Jewish friends understand. You know, it, it starts off with, oh yeah, my niece is named after so-and-so because you can't name, name her to somebody who's living. Right. Or else they'll, and they're like, huh? And don't worry about it, it's just Jewish. Specifically Ashkenazi, but it's just Jewish. There's a queerness there. The word queer so was- queerness you, meaning not normative? Not normative, right. Other, different, not the norm, and certainly not a model for behavior. I was thinking this makes me think about the conversation that you talk about in Kosher Soul with a professor friend of yours about queerness as mm -hmm. not, uh, bringing it beyond the sexual identity label to this idea of differentness. And the, in that conversation, the question comes up, can food be queer? Absolutely. How? Um, <laughs> Gefilte fish is extremely queer. <laughs> I mean, like, there are so many foods. I, I can think of another one that has nothing to do with anything. With balut. What is that? What is that? Balut is the fertilized egg of a chicken. Oh, yeah. That is a delicacy in East Asian, some East Asian cultures. Like, that's queer food. I ain't going into it because, you know. I was surprised you don't like gefilte fish, Michael. You, you put it right in there. I don't, I don't dig it. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, like, <laughs> listen, listen. Not to mention that my rabbi used to call it gefilte, gefilte fish. <laughs> a Sephardic rabbi. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I understand why it's there. I celebrate why it's there. Most Jews in America don't understand why it's there. It's there because, as you know, this is one of the foods that fish was very important to acknowledging the coming of the Mashiach. 
And for the women who were writing tachinas and cooking the food, this was their to part of their Torah, was how they cooked and what they served and what they shared. And so it has that level. On um, completely humorous level, only blacks and Jews create foods that they can use to eat other things with that are more important than the food. Givota fish is a vehicle for horseradish. <laughs> okay. Chitlins are a vehicle for hot sauce. Mm. There's no reason to eat a single chitlin or gefilte fish, except to indulge in the painful consumption. Well, it's funny, because when people ask me, do you like gefilte fish? I say, I like horseradish. So, what I point, just done said. Point proven. Exactly. Um, and that's, and, it, and that's also this other element to our, to our food is this sardonic humor yeah. that nobody else has. And it's, it, it, you know, I grew up in a very multicultural area outside of Washington, D.C. I grew up with a lot of Italians, a lot of Chinese, and a lot of Greeks. Three very ancient cultures with food. They're not humorous about their food. There's no, there's no side joke going on. You know, blacks and Jews, it's always there. My late mother, Michael, come here. What's up? You got to eat this. Why? It's nasty. You got to eat this nasty. Mom, why you got to eat this nasty? One time I actually asked my mother, why do we have to eat our oppression? She, don't, don't ask questions. Eat it. It's nasty. Jewish folks, try it. It's terrible. <laughs> why do I have to eat it if it's terrible? Because it's terrible. <laughs> and I learned, I was like, wait a minute, what's being communicated here? Number one, you take great joy in understanding what joy is, knowing the negative from the good. In, in lives with so much negativity, prejudice, pain, bigotry, knowing what is good and what is bad is a, an important skill. Does this play into, I think it's what you call the mutual intelligibility of blacks and Jews, and if it does, yes. we're different. The idea is we're different, yes. yes. We speak different languages, but spiritually, our spirits are mutually intelligent. It's like Portuguese and Spanish. Yep. Tell us about that. It, you know, there is, a, there is a feeling, there is a notion. You know, we talk about the food and, you know. So I, I, I was really coming through Marcy's work. Maybe you should explain who Marcy is. Okay, so Marcy Cohen Ferris is um, part of kind of a powerhouse couple with her husband, Bill. She has her own life. Bill Ferris used to run the, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, but is also a folklorist in his own right. Mm -hmm. And so Marcy is from Blytheville, Arkansas, which is a hopping Jewish town, I assure you. And she decided, she has this beautiful collection of recipes passed down from her great-grandmother, grandmother, mother to her. And it's the entire journey of her family, from Lublin to America to the South and beyond. And she noticed, like, there's not a whole lot about Southern Jewish culture. People think there was like five Jews. There weren't. There were more Jews in Charleston and Savannah than there were in New York and Philadelphia in the colonial period in those areas. And Marcy has really done the work to say, you cannot talk about these Jewish communities without talking about the fact they were surrounded by the largest black communities in America. That they co-developed many aspects of their food, their culture, their history. And that later on, other Jewish communities were formed. Memphis, Montgomery. Montgomery, Alabama was, was founded by a Jewish man who had a Native American wife. But you didn't know that. And there was also New Orleans and Natchez. And I mean, all these different places. I remember going to Donaldsonville, Louisiana, which has like no Jews left. And it's right outside of New Orleans. And it's what they call both Sugarcane Alley and Cancer Alley. There's an old Jewish cemetery there. 
descendants will come there of, of on occasion, but it's the black Catholic and um, Baptist ladies that take care of the, the cemetery as an act of charity. Stones just on the graves. Some of the people buried in that cemetery were born in the 1740s in Alsace-Lorraine. And when New Orleans was a French colony, came over. Having said all this, she wrote a beautiful book based on her dissertation called Matzo Ball Gumbo, based on a recipe that, from a lady I, have, I had the blessing to meet, Mrs. Mildred Covert. And Mrs. Mildred Covert was like the real deal drive Miss Daisy. She had the black and white leopard print coat, the blood red Prada shoes. She wasn't playing. <laughs> and she had a whole story to tell about Growing up in New Orleans, she was the only one of her siblings born in America. And she was very outspoken about her relationship with African Americans and the food, et cetera. It was wonderful. But I mean, going through Marcy's work, I figured some things out. Number one, Ashkenazi Jews who came to the Deep South, really, there was a pressure to assimilate, to look the part. Their relationship with black folks which was post-slavery, post-bellum, for the most part. Not always, but for the most part, mm -hmm. was really essential to that. Sephardic Jews who came to the, the post-bellum South had a lot of the same ingredients, but that's where you have a lot of division, right? Because if I have cornmeal, and you got cornmeal, and you got okra, and I got okra, and you got hot peppers and eggplant, and I got the same thing, what do I really need you for? It's too close to comfort, right? It's like, eh, sure, we could make this mix together, but I really prefer my way. And of course, there are very different ways of eating, very Mediterranean, Middle Eastern versus African, African-American Southern, right? Okay, but for Ashkenazi Jews, that mixture of black-eyed peas and kishkas and matzo meal fried chicken, all that stuff, was absolutely, like, out of sight. And they took pride, these communities took great pride and having that cuisine, the problem is, is that what happens when those communities start to like, die back? People no longer want to live in those communities the same way they did before. It means the recipes start to die and leave. Yeah, I mean, this to me is a great sadness of foods dying, recipes dying. Especially this kind of vibrant cuisine yeah. that has hundreds upon hundreds of recipes. I mean, at least um, not only Mrs. Covert, but other writers, they did cookbooks, sisterhood cookbooks, there's Marcy's work, there's a substantial body of knowledge. But I guess what I'm getting at here is that, you know, if you look at the, the frugality, the, the stretching of foods, the love of the mother, the love of the family that comes to the cooking, all those values are the same. The, the fact that the history is attached to the food. And we're talking now about the black and yes. Jewish. Especially in the in the South, yeah. and the history attached to the food, and the fact that you know, for most Black and Jewish communities in America, you can't possibly have those meals without having a conversation about the people who prepared the meals of the near and distant past. It's it's it's. I mean, I'm sure many communities do this, but especially African American and Jewish communities do this. You know, you you say something that was very interesting to me in kosher soul about the way Ashkenazi food has been traditionally characterized as... It's brown, it's gray, it's bland. There's it, that aspect to it? And even worse, the whitest of the white. Oh, that's, that's no good. That's, that's deep. That's deep. What you say, I think, this, I think this is a critique on people who, like me, who have written about Ashkenazi food and who describe it as um, a product of two influences, poverty and kashru. And you say it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the story that you just told about Marcy and creolization gets at some of that complexity. Right. Could you talk to us about so, that? So for example, so in meeting you and meeting um, the folks at uh, Mile End and Jeffrey Yaskowitz and Liz Alper from Gifford and other places, other folks who are doing this work. I mean, here's the deal. The compotes and, and drinks and preserves and 
you know, the the the, the, the shav, like shav is you know this beautiful green color. Yeah, love it. The crane, the way crane looks with the beets and and the horseradish mixed together. Okay, so it's not that much different from what our folks dealt with coming from Alabama and Georgia, South Carolina to the north. Because in Eastern Europe, the Stettlach in Eastern Europe, what goes on? You have gardens and bartering and farms and air, water, and sea. And then you get moved to the, the postage stamp of the, the Lower East Side, where people are raising geese in basements and, and things on rooftops and pigs in backyards and things. It's like, what? With like a million other people around them. Imagine, imagine an Italian family with a pig in the backyard of a tenement building that has 400 people in it. Compete that. And then when I, when I read 97 Orchard and it was these descriptions of you know, preserving the, the squashes and other things and mm -hmm. the way they would look and just the whole, and how that you know, changed over time from the 1880s to the 1920s when Italian immigration was curtailed. What does that look like? What does that all mean, right? So people don't really understand like this transformation, I mean, from my grandparents and great-grandparents to leave the rural South or semi-rural South where there was all this natural abundance and this know-how to urban communities where the weather, the climate were different, where you, you didn't have the time to do the things you could do. So, and, and then of course, what happens right after that? We're also post-war, post-migration, the industrialization of American food. So I understand that for a lot of American Jews, Ashkenazi food in particular is gray, brown, white. It comes out of a box or a jar. What do you say when they say that? No, it's richer than, it's much more, and it, and it has its own language and philosophy. And you know, I also had him a copy of Michael Wex's book, uh -huh. Rhapsody and Schmaltz, oh, okay. brilliant. Or even goes down to like the words and the language and says, there's, there's a lot of gems in the, the very language of talking about Ashkenazi food. But also I feel like there's a certain amount of misogyny involved in both. You know, uh, Eric Adams recently did, he's a ve proud vegan. I'm, I'm glad he's, a, he's you know, open about his health journey. What I don't like is that he indicts his mama and grandmama. Well, they made us unhealthy. what you say? No, they cooked out of love. And not everybody cooked that way. My grandparents, a blessed memory, my grandmother on my father's side, 95. My granddaddy, 99, two months after his 100th birthday. My step-grandmother, 101. You know what they ate? Fish from the mill pond, corn, sweet potatoes from the, from the field, collard greens. It, they didn't eat Bojangles. They didn't eat Cracker Barrel. They didn't eat no McDonald's. They didn't appropriate Southern comfort food. They ate the food that they raised with their own two hands. And some have been up north and come back. Same thing with Ashkenazi, I mean, Ashkenazi food. People who are evangelists for this new, that's a word to use, isn't it? <laughs> evangelists, as it were, for this new sort of DIY food are coming against people who only know the stuff from the box. And of course, when I was, I was telling um, Jane that I was in an event where the Kitchen Sisters did a whole program on falafel and hummus. And um, they were saying that part of the reason why these foods caught on in American Jewish life as the symbols of Israeli food, which they really were Palestinian food, was that there was this antipathy towards the mothers, the women of Eastern Europe. Well, their food was unhealthy, and it made us not so much men. You hear that? It's not, it's not manly food. It's not food that strengthens the body. It's not healthy for you. But the food of the Sabra, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Or, you know, this idea that, you know, African Americans went through this too. It was not to say that we don't have significant health challenges and issues with, with industrial food, American food, right? It's just to say that, you know, Elijah Muhammad did something very similar. He, he, he said, 
Don't eat collard greens, sweet potatoes, or black eyed peas. Those are some of the healthiest foods you can eat in the southern repertoire. But it, the, for him, the association with slavery was so deep and so painful that they were considered unhealthy and demonic. So I talk a little bit about that and talk, yeah, I use the Lenny Bruce joke to intro, intro that chapter. That's great. Is, is there any chance that you would want to read the Lenny Bruce? Yes. Okay. Can, yes, let's do that. Can we do it? I love, I, I happen to love this. It's a great, yeah. And you know, Lenny Bruce gets a lot of dreck because he was a very, shall we say, colorful comic. In many ways, Lenny Bruce walked so that Richard Pryor could run. They were of that same generation and same ilk. But um, Lenny Bruce says something amazing, and it's a whole, it's a whole sermon. And it's, you know, basically he goes, Negroes are all Jews. And it just makes me go, let me look it up. I should have marked it. No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But I had to sort of go there because he also speaks to sort of a, I don't know how to put this, like a, a general feeling. Lenny Bruce was from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, early 70s, American life, where there was a feeling along with civil rights there was a sort of a connection. Let's see here. I think it's in section one, right? I, yeah, it's early on. Okay. Should we, we'll find it and come no, no, back no. to it or you got it? They are with us in this process. Okay. There we go. Okay, here we are. Here we go. Negroes are all Jews. Dig, I'm Jewish. Count Basie's Jewish. Ray Charles is Jewish. Eddie Cantor is Goyish. B'nai B'rith is Goyish. Hadassah is Jewish. Marine Corps, heavy Goyim, dangerous. If you live in New York or any big city, you are a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic. If you live in New York, you're Jewish. If you live in Butte, Montana, <laughs> you're Goyish, even if you're Jewish. <laughs> Kool-Aid is Goyish. Evaporated milk is Goyish, even if the Jews invented it. Chocolate is Jewish and fudge is goyish. Fruit salad is Jewish. Lime jello is goyish. Lime soda is extremely goyish. All Drake's cakes are goyish. Pumpernickel is Jewish. And as you know, white bread is extremely goyish. Instant potatoes, goyish. Black cherry soda, very Jewish. Macaroons are very Jewish. Trailer parks are so goyish that Jews won't go near them. The Jack Parr show is very goyish. But Negroes are all Jews. That's a hell of a routine. Because you know what he's saying. He's saying this post-melting pot. And he's not talking about literal. He's talking about that unspoken feeling. And I'll, I'll, I'll segue this into our food part, right? Good. Because to be able to create and curate a life that is African-American and Jewish. Not everybody does what I do, I get that. And, I, and at the very beginning of the book, I basically say, you know what, if you're expecting me to define this for everybody, good luck with that. Because I don't wanna be, I don't wanna play HNIC, head Negro in charge. I don't wanna be the one to gatekeep for other people's expression of their identities. Because so often, one person from an oppressed and marginalized group will write a book or do a project and all of a sudden everybody will go, what they said. And then it blocks out the ability for everybody else to have their expression and do what they need to do and tell their truth and I don't like that, I hate that. So what I basically say is, yeah, I do my thing, which is mixing up Afro Ashkafardi, putting it all together and having my own expression. Food, the aesthetics of the table, uh, what the holla cover looks like, it's from Ghana. The Tali Tote, they're from Ethiopia, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. The, the Kipote have Audre Lorde and James Baldwin and Zora Neale Hurston and Jackie Robinson on them. I, I, I go, um, the, well, there's the West African brisket, right, with the suya spice and the peppers and the onions and the tomatoes. It's like West African stew, but only it's brisket. And then the preserved lemon. I learned so many things from Jews from North Africa and the Sephardic world. Preserved lemon and sabzi and um, rose water and orange water, and all those things become staples 
in how I approach food. Um, not to mention the fact that, yes, I've made chili. I don't like it, <laughs> but I've made it. I love kasha varnish because it's my, one of my favorite foods in, on, on the planet. I eat it twice a year, and that's it, because it's got to be schmaltz. If it's not chicken fat, it's not, it ain't coming on the table, you know? Um, so for me, it's this, both of these cultures are global. You know, I just, I'm, just, I'm reading right now um, Esther David's B'nai Appetit about Indian, the different Indian Jewish, there's not one Indian Jewish community, there's like multiple Indian Jewish communities and the way they eat and the way they express themselves. And so some of the same foods keep coming up, bamya, okra, the hot peppers, and I'm just, I'm excited reading this. You know, there's Jewish Chinese food, there's Jewish Brazilian food, and of course there's Jewish food from all over Africa and Europe, et cetera. And of course, there's the African diaspora, which is spread across the entire globe. So you don't, it's not just you're locked into these traditions, what we perceive to be the tradition. You're actually able to now look at it and go, okay, let me, let me, let me connect the dots. Jews in China, Jews in Latin America, Jews in Africa, great. Africans who went to the Far East, Africans and Asians cooking together, in Trinidad, Tobago, which is one of my heritages, um, but also Jamaica, but also Louisiana, Harlem. What happens if we put it all together? We make a kosher soul roll. We have, some, we have a spring roll, we have some vegetarian oyster sauce made from mushrooms. We have um, some pastrami, we have some collard greens, some scallions. Y'all hungry yet? You know what we also have, Michael? We have your Seder plate. So with Passover approaching, can you talk to us about I haven't even done Hanukkah do yet. For God's sakes. Oh my God. Uh, it's um, a, little, a little premature, but it's a, it's, it's a great example of what you okay, do. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll, okay, I'll lead you, let, let me just lead you quickly into these couple holidays. So let's start with Hanukkah. Hanukkah, fried foods, also oily foods. I've extended that in my middle age to like, ain't no way in hell we can keep up with eight days of deep fried food. So let's, let's make some salads, okay? And some, and some olive oil based dressing and some roasted vegetables. Can we do that? Thanks. But also it's one of the two times a year I make matzo meal fried chicken, which I also make at Pesach. But I, it's the only time of year I make beignets. And it works, the matzo meal? Oh, hell yeah, it works. Okay. Um, they put it in the New York Times, hey. Okay. Um, but you know what? Don't, 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 death be not proud because as soon as you put a recipe in the New York Times, there's those 20 people in the comments. Well, actually, I use this for this and I need that for that. And I did this for this and it's better if. Shut up. You ain't coming to my table. Ain't nobody asks you. You know, so there's that. Um, our, 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 this year I'm going to do beignets and puff puff. You need puff puff. No. Oyimbo, che. What you need chop eat? Puff puff is West African donuts that are basically like beignets, but a little bit more, they're bigger. They're the kind of, and you do like cinnamon sugar, or whatever with them. And then I do New Orleans style beignets uh, and mandazi from East Africa. So those, instead of sufgan yot, the jelly, I'm not, I was never a fan of the, the sufgan yot. Until I went to Israel, and saw them in Machna Yehuda, and they're really beautiful. In America, all you get is that, that one like jelly-filled donut in the Hebrew school. In Israel, you have all the different flavors and types. I'm gonna hook you up with some. Okay, a deal, uh, deal, deal, deal. Okay. So moving forward, we have, you know, do a lot of salad, roast vegetables. Then Pesach, the Seder plate is the most important thing. I have two Seder plates, traditional, and my African-American Seder plate for both Seders. Um, so without referring to the traditional one right now for the sake of time, um, Zoroaf, the bone is represented for an um, African-American Seder plate by the chicken bone. Why? Because um, the chicken bone represents um, migration. Um, when, our, when our grandparents and great-grandparents got on the train to come north, 
the classic story was you had a shoebox, the grandma put rolls in, deviled eggs, fried chicken, foods that would last a couple hours without refrigeration. The wax paper would be in there, and the, the, the best part is every single elder told the same story. As soon as the train started moving, the tickets, the tickets were checked, you could hear the boxes opening and the, the wax paper. And I just thought that was just like, I don't know if you know what this means to me. These people were so courageous. They were so damn brave. Is that, do you see that as an exodus? It's, yes, it is a, one of the many forms of exodus. Letziat Mitzrayim, going from a narrow place into a space of wide expansiveness that occur in African American history. And of course, like the collard greens for the maror, the bitter herbs, um, I use hot pepper for the horseradish, well, the chazaret. Um, I use um, salt water to talk about the waters of the Middle Passage. Um, I use uh, sweet potato for the karpas. Why sweet potato for karpas? Well, one of the older Eastern European traditions was using a boiled potato. Why? Because wasn't no damn parsley growing in Russia in March? Are you kidding me? You couldn't even find a ba blade of grass growing in, 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 in Russia in March. So you had to, what's the next best thing? So for us, I was like, oh, wow. Sweet potato, very common food, on the plantations, etc. It was also, you know, we made yam from that. And I also started putting okra on the table. Okra, because it is an African culture, it's a direct link, and it, and it brings together all the communities of the African diaspora and connects it with. There's something also about all those seeds. Don't yes. they, don't, they, they must mean something. Those seeds are a story of also another form of survival. Now there's the, the myth of the seeds in the hair. Complete nonsense. So when you see people on TikTok talking about, you know, they hid seeds in the hair coming over the middle passage. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me just be honest with each other. Can you imagine being on a boat, locked down in your own waist, in chains, with a, with a hole crawling with rats and having seeds in your hair? Don't make, make it math, make the math math, make it make sense. It don't. However, when enslaved, form, excuse me, when formerly enslaved Maroons in South America, they would, they would actually braid okra seeds and rice seeds into their hair. That's true because they weren't on a damn boat. But because they were, with the Portuguese or British or the French came to burn down their farm and settlement, the Maroons were brilliant. They, they, already, they were already 10 feet ahead of them. They were already miles ahead. How they preserved those things, they would braid them into the hair, they would carry them in sacred um, objects. That's true. The thing on the boat didn't happen. But, it's, but it, it's a metaphor. We carried the seeds in our head and the okra, bonds together all the different communities, even um, Jewish diaspora and African diaspora, but yeah. also African diaspora. Um, and some people even use, I use whole cake because I have a kidney oat or a corn in my table, rice in my table. Is this for the matzah? The yes, okay. but not, okay. but I don't, I don't actually, in, we don't actually use that. Okay. It's just symbolic on the table. Got it. But my, um, my Jamaican cousins, they use bami, which is a cassava bread. Flat, like the, Jam the Jamaican mm -hmm. equivalent of hoe cake, which was made from cassava. And which is also halakhically okay because it's not grain, so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that all kind of comes together. And, the, and of course, like in later editions of this book, I hope to really go in on Cape Verdean, Brazilian, more Caribbean be great. stories, because it's so important people understand these were important transitional areas. There's even a really beautiful book, y'all. I know we're running out of time. But there's a really beautiful book that was published like a year or two ago called Once We Were Slaves. Um, Mary, I forget her name, American Jewish scholar, basically traced an entire family from the Caribbean. These were the descendants of black women 
and Sephardic Jewish men who were then emancipated, converted and emancipated, came to New York, and then they became the parents, the ancestors of a lot of New York prominent Jewish families with black and Jewish blood in their veins. This is not uncommon, though. When I, went to, when I was in Africa, the notions of connection to Jewish heritage were not uncommon. Why but right is a, this history submerged? What's, what's going on? It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Why? How? Because how can you, you've been told you have no history, you have no history worth, worth mentioning, or that people, we were, we were living these complex lives. You know, I'll, I'll, when I was growing up, Africa's the dark continent. No, I wasn't. Africa had her own history. And what's interesting is that in Africa, you don't have to have one or the other. That's the thing that Westerners get very wrong about Africa. In Africa, the traditional religion sits alongside um, Christianity, Islam, mm -hmm. ideas, Jewish beliefs, all of it, side by side. No one goes, that conflicts with that. So uh, another form of Creole. It's another form of Creolization. As my grandmother, bless Marie, used to say, she used to say, one of these keys is gonna get me into heaven. <laughs> Which good. I did not understand until I went to Africa and saw it with uh, my own two eyes. At any rate, um, is, yeah. I just see some. It, it, what is our time looking like? Is that Gabriel? I can't. Maybe just, I, I know we want to do maybe a few questions. Maybe we can take like, Sure. Two or can three would be great. So we should go to the audience? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's hear. What. Uh, hi, what is your what is your take on uh, people who've influenced uh, mm -hmm. celebs like Kanye West and Kyrie Irving? Uh, they they call themselves bl Black Jews, Black Hebrews, Black Israelites, Five Percenters, and they all claim to be the true Jews. Okay, cool. Kyrie and Kanye are two different situations for me. Kyrie is not the same boat. Kanye West is a jerk. The th I'm going to tell you flat out. He is make. He calls himself a Christian. I don't know about that. My mama was a Christian. My grandmother was a Christian. I have a lot of respect for that space. The problem we have is that he has a very muddled understanding. He's not really an Israelite. I can, I can deal with them. I've been dealing with them for 20 some years. Excuse me, 30 some years. Because if you know DC, you know they love that spot of sidewalk near Gallery Place. I've been hollering at them for years. And it's not, and I, I get, people also, they, the pushback against people like me has been really disruptive. Like, well, you're not really Jewish, you're like Rachel Dolezal. Because you, you eat kosher food doesn't make you a Jew. I beg your damn pardon. I taught Hebrew school, Hebrew school for 15 years. Seventh grade. I Listen. Tefillin doesn't make me Jewish. White hairs in my head because my kids drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. Getting ready for the bar and bat mitzvah makes me Jewish. You know what I'm saying? They'll never take that away from us. I, I, I feel like the people he... I think what this really shows is this awful moment when people, not just him, but Candace Owens, others, they, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it, Ben Jabiro, when they fall in with their friends in the far right, a significant part of that is hating us as Jews. Yep. Sad to say that, but the same thing with anti-blackness. It's inherent in what these people do. And so when, so when like the, the, the pushback comes, they go, why are you all being so mean? That's who your audience is. Hmm. The thing that got me about uh, Kanye West that was the worst part, above all the nonsense, right? Oh, whatever, man, was when he talked about scaring Jewish children. That pissed me off. 
That made me really, 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 really mad. When he, his statement was, I want Jewish children to be afraid and ask their parents, why is he mad at us? Oh and that, 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 that's what set me up more than anything else he said. You, you know, I'm, 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 he's dealing with some, many, many issues. I do not give him a pass for any of them. But what, what people don't get is that, what happens to the next brother and sister who walk into a shul? Who's there to pray? Who's there to be part of a community? When they get judged based on this fool, it already happens for us that we aren't always welcome in certain places, certain communities. It, it's really, it's, it's, you know, a lot of, I mentioned this in the book where some of my friends were just like, well, I went to shul and somebody who's visiting treats me like I'm the guest. No, I'm a citizen of this culture, this people, this, this shul. You're the guest. But this gets amplified when we have the face of anti-Jewishness be somebody like them. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a shame. So I, 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 I wish him healing. I wish him a good smack in the face from Jennifer Lewis, because she promised him one. But she'll say, baby, I'll give you a hug after I give you a smack in the face so you can get, you know, figure yourself out because you're, you're affecting the lives of many people who didn't ask for this, and people who look up to you. I'm gonna be real with you. When this, this brother and I are the same age, when he came out on the scene after being a producer, and he was, he was rapping through his jaw and it was wide shut. And he, had, he was quoting, quoting our um, auntie uh, Shaka Khan. And he was talking about survival and persistence and fighting back and standing up as a black man. God, that made me proud. I was like, wow, I need to listen to this man's music. I, don't, I won't listen to a single thing he's done, even on YouTube. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I will not forgive Hitler. I will not forgive anybody who won the death of my people. I will not forgive anyone who spoke ill of George Floyd or Harriet Tubman. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. Get it together. And stop leading these kids into, into muddiness. Last comment on that. My problem is when I go on social, I'm a social media person. When I go and look at the comments, the, the infection is deep. People actually think that he's doing something righteous. And that's scary. But the only thing that we can do to, to push back against that is to have light. To talk to each other. Well, to tell stories. To tell stories. I mean, this right here, <laughs> this is the result of centuries of people advocating so that women could have something approaching an equal voice to men. So that black people and white people could sit on the same stage and talk to each other. This project of increasing our humanity cannot end despite any distraction. It's not worth it. What we do, I'm, listen, <laughs> we have we have both made contributions, continue to make contributions to preserve the voices of our ancestors. So, whatever they want to do, they can do, but we're going to keep doing us. Okay. You know, I had one, do, oh, there's another question. I, I did have a question that I really did want to ask you, Michael, if you if Sure, you I'll make it quick. It's about tahinas. The prayers yes. that women, do you, people know what a tahina is? And it's not tahina, it's tahinas. These were prayers said by women over their cholents the and their kogels, their halas, to ensure a successful outcome. Right. Michael, you tell us in the book that you say tahinas. Right. I want to hear what your tahinas sound like. Oh, goodness. Sometimes I'll be breaking it down. I'll be like, please let this bread burn. Please let the crust of this cocoa come up perfectly. <laughs> and then other times I really am like, the, so the, the one that's most important to me is the bagel family challah. Okay. So Joe Nathan wrote a book called The Foods of Israel Today. One of the recipes is the bagel family challah. And it's a family that were master bakers in Europe, but were obliterated by the Shoah. It's, the most, it's one of the best challah recipes I've ever had in my life. 
this is the challah recipe that I use for every single holiday, except Pesach, and every single shop is when I make challah. And I talk to them. And it's a weird blend of sort of West African libation tradition mm -hmm. and Tahina's like, may, you know, may your soul and spirit and, you know, may, this, may the nechrayas, may the responsibility I have to honor Hashem and the Shabbat. And I mean, I mean, it really, it's always impromptu. It's always from the heart. But like, it's the same kind of thing that I do when I do living history work at like Williamsburg and other places. I will actually have a quiet moment of just like talking to the ancestors that were in that place to prevent my food from burning or being messed up. And it's not vain, it's not vanity. It's like, please share in the process. May your, may your, may your merit share in the process of making this, because I'm using this to educate people, right? To show them the best of our heritage. Well, I can tell you that I'm going to start in my kitchen a tahina uh, tradition. Wow. It was, this was very this was powerful to me. So I, I, among other things, I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for being here. Y'all are fantastic. What a community we created. Um, thank you so much, Michael you. and Jane. Thank you.